Hello and welcome to Travel Through Time, the podcast that's made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. Violet Moller. Today we're going to be talking about Ravenna, the Italian town which is home to some of the most beautiful Roman mosaics still in existence today and the town's significance during the Western Roman Empire. In 500 AD most Italian cities were sliding into decline. Rome had been violently sacked twice in the previous century and Milan, sometime capital of the empire, had suffered a similar fate. In stark contrast, Ravenna, which lies to the south of Venice on the coast, was on the rise. A flourishing city that was home to Theodoric, the Ostrogothic king of Italy, who was busy adorning his capital with beautiful churches and palaces. Our guide on this exciting journey is Professor Judith Herrin. Ravenna, capital of empire, crucible of Europe, is the result of nine years of meticulous research and tells the story of the multitude of rulers, doctors, lawyers, craftsmen, cosmologists and theologians who lived and worked there. Heron worked in Birmingham, Paris, Munich, Istanbul and Princeton before becoming Professor of Late Antique and Byzantine Studies at King's College, London and she is now the Constantine Leventis Visiting Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Classics there. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Judith. Um, I'm very excited about our journey that we're going to be taking today because we're going to Ravenna, which has been top of my wish list of places to go for a long, long time. And as at the moment none of us can really go anywhere, this is, I'm hoping, going to be the next best thing, a virtual journey far back in time. So in the introduction to your book, Judith, uh, you talk about the first time that you visited Ravenna as as a teenager with your mother. Can you tell us about that first um, trip and what it was about the city which captured your imagination? Well, thank you very much for having me and for asking about that. Of course, I don't remember very much because I was a probably a rather bolshy teenager. And I wasn't as interested in the mosaics as my mother, who was very determined to see them. And she'd taken me to Italy. Um, This was one of the key points that we were to visit Ravenna and see the mosaics. And I do remember very distinctly the mausoleum of Gala Placidia, just because the I'd never seen a heavens laid out like this, dark blue sky with brilliant golden and silver stars and in the dome and all round the walls, all the upper parts of the walls covered with these glorious, very, very bright mosaics, geometric patterns as well as deer and dove drinking up fountains and figures and then marble all over the floor and the lower part of the walls and these alabaster windows, which were modern in fact, but let in a very yellow diffuse light, very magical. And it's tiny, so it, it, it is a very unusual tomb. And it may, and of course it didn't become a tomb, it was a chapel, but there it was. And that made a big impact. These extraordinary depictions of the Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora, the Empress, Why are they there in the church of San Vitale in Ravenna? Uh, They never went there. They barely left Constantinople. He was a rather an armchair emperor, not a military general. So it is, it was very disturbing to me when I read the guidebooks and looked for explanations of why Justinian and Theodora are so prominently displayed in the mosaics, right in the sanctuary area, either side of the altar. I thought you know, they should explain why these pictures are here. So there was a good, a good reason for trying to explore why they were there. And I didn't find that other books gave a satisfactory explanation. 
hence a great deal of work on Ravenna. <laughs> because something else that has struck me often when I'm studying this period in history is how jumbled up uh, the people were. You know, th this idea that suddenly the, the Roman Empire stopped and then the Goths arrived and took over. It, it, it's, it's just completely false. It happened over a very, very long period of time and many of the Gothic tribes were adopting Roman customs and were very interconnected with um, the Roman world. Could you just set the scene a bit for us in the 5th century? What was happening in terms of the Roman Empire in the East and in the West and the Gothic tribes and, and the political situation? I think it's very important to remember that there was one Mediterranean world and it was still governed by the Roman emperors who had transported themselves to Constantinople. And they had built the new Rome, a, a replacement for old Rome, on the Bosphorus, on the division between Europe and Asia. And this was a capital city that was growing and expanding and becoming the obvious megalopolis of the known world. And in the fifth century, the Western Roman Empire had been very severely attacked by groups of non-Romans, many of whom, we call them barbarians, but of course many of whom were actually very familiar with Roman customs, partly through their military service as mercenaries. And of course, in the, in the middle of the fourth century, uh, the Ostrogoths first, and then the Visigoths and the Burgundians and the Swaves, all adopted Christianity. But they adopted the form of Christianity, which was then imposed by the emperors in Constantinople, which was the doctrines of Arius. And Arius, a deacon of Alexandria in the early fourth century, had written a great deal of theology very sophisticated theology, in which he had investigated what was monotheistic and what was special about Christianity. And he understood that the problem for a monotheistic faith, which says there is only one God, is that this God took the form of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, often shown as a dove in representations, and that this was a, tri, a, tr a trinity, a triune Godhead. And of course, at the same time, we have to remember there were lots of other Christianities, definitions of Christianity that were not exactly, didn't conform exactly to what people in Constantinople or Alexandria thought, because it was the great centres of Alexandria, Antioch and Constantin Constantinople and Jerusalem that discussed and debated and decided these uh, definitions at councils that were held of all the Christians, universal councils, um, the first of which had been called by Constantine the Great in 325 to the city of Nicaea. So these are the, these are the, we can see this is the way that an overarching definition of Christianity had been engendered, but in the course of the fourth century, it was criticized, the Arian definitions became dominant again. There were all sorts of complexities and the Goths had simply been exposed to Christianity and adopted it with great enthusiasm and, and determination through the Bishop Ulfila, who translated all the Gospels into Gothic for them so that they could celebrate the liturgy in Gothic with all the hymns and the readings and the liturgical ceremonies uh, in their own language. And they, they clung to that. It was part of their identity. But basically, there was a there was a conflict over definitions of the faith, particularly centering on the human and divine natures as they were combined in Christ, the Son of God. That was the key problem, which became really very, very dominant in the fifth century. And councils held in the East went through great discussions, very elaborate investigations to come up with a correct definition. And finally, in 451, the Council of Chalcedon is imposed what we now understand to be the Catholic definition of the equal natures and equal powers of the, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, God, in three parts. Yeah. I'd like to ask you now which year you, you would like to take us back to in time. I would like to return to the year 500 AD. Wonderful. And um, before we go there and, um, and go to your first scene, can you set the scene, give us a bit of the general political situation um, at that time? 
So in the year 500, the Roman Empire is now based in Constantinople, which is a great and expanding city, and it's ruled by the Emperor Anastasius, who is himself rather an odd figure, not being a military man and a general, but a bureaucrat, an administrator, who'd been trained in the imperial court and had held an official position as silentiarios. This is the man who holds a sort of rod of office. And when the emperor moves through the palace, he goes ahead of him saying, silence, silence, the emperor approaches. And everybody uh, makes a little bowing and, and gets out of the way or stops talking or singing or making a noise. So he's a very important court official. And he only became emperor because the widowed empress Ariadne decided she didn't want to marry another military man. She wanted to promote this efficient administrator who was a civilian, who would keep the bureaucracy in order, get in the taxes, run the court, run the empire, and leave the generals to do the fighting. While other kings in different parts of the West set up their own capitals, we have the Burgundians based on Lyon, we have the Visigoths in Toulouse, we have other Visigoths uh, moving south into Spain, and the Franks in northern France, who are just in the year 500, they're just coming into northern France, and their ruler, Clovis, is the one non-Roman ruler who has decided to adopt the Catholic definition of Christianity. And he's had all his nobles baptized it and converted to Christianity using those definitions, in contrast to all the other Gothic and Burgundian and Swavic and other Vandal. That's very interesting. Can I just quickly ask, do you think that was because of a genuine belief that the Catholic form of Christianity was the true form? Or do you think that was a political decision? Absolutely a political decision. Okay. I think it's very little to do with de theological definition. <laughs> It suited Clovis to distinguish himself from the other rulers of the West. And he also wished to associate himself in some way with the, with the Bishop of Rome, although he was not very uh, um, attractive. I mean, there's no close connection that we can find. But at the same time, his notion of uh, what Christianity should be was not to be associated with the Gothic uh, identity. And so he wished to distinguish himself in political terms. And he then fought against the Goths. Uh, quite a lot of his uh, campaigns were against the Goths uh, in order to establish his own kingdom in northern France. But he too was deeply impressed by the Roman traditions. And when he entered Paris, uh, as he made it his capital, he rode in a chariot wearing the costume of an imperial patrician, scattering gold coin to the crowd as if he was a, an, an emperor. emperor. Wow. Um, okay, so I think let's just go to Italy, because um, if you could just briefly set the scene in Italy, um, because I think in, in 493, Odoasa is, is killed, and there's a new ruler of Italy who's going to feature prominently in our um, later discussion. Yes, this is Theodoric, the Ostrogothic king, who had brought his people on a long, long migration from the eastern Balkans up the valley of the Danube, across the Hungarian plain, over the uh, Julian Alps at the eastern end of the Alps, and into northern Italy, and he assumed that he was doing this with the support of the emperor in Constantinople. But of course, their negotiations are lost to us and we're not quite sure what Zeno thought of this. However, it was convenient for Zeno to get rid of the, the Goths who had been plaguing his, his empire in the East. And he also wished them to remove Odoasa and reassert imperial authority in uh, Italy, in Rome, in Ravenna, in the major cities where it was uh, it, it there had been traditions of imperial rule for centuries but in the course of the fifth century rivalries had allowed all sorts of dis disturbances and disasters and rome had been sacked twice a very a very much reduced city and ravenna had been built up very much as the imperial capital after the um, empress had abandoned milan so there were lots of major, major cities in Italy, but Ravenna was the one that was growing and getting in importance. Whereas in Rome, there was really a very, very decaying, declining, depopulated city, no longer a capital. 
and it was very much ruled by the Bishop of Rome, who had to take on a lot of administrative responsibilities. Okay, wonderful. I think we should go to your first scene now, please. So we're going to go to Constantinople, the city of Constantine, founded by him in 330 AD and acknowledged as the new Rome. And it is the unique capital of the Roman Empire in the year 500. And in a way, I think we can see it's the creation of this great city is one of the finest achievements of the Roman Empire. And it has this extremely efficient administration now run by the Emperor Anastasius. And he was, as I say, a very a rather unusual emperor after a long run of military leaders and generals who had um, barely sustained attacks on the uh, borders of the East Roman Empire by the same barbarian troops, Goths, and many other tribes who wanted all to come and live in the sunnier climes of the Mediterranean rather than the Balkans. And in the year 500, Anastasius has reigned for nine years. And in that year, he receives an embassy uh, from uh, Ravenna, led by Festus, who is a Roman senator. And he arrives on an embassy from King Theodoric the Goth, who is ruling in Ravenna. Now, Festus is an experienced diplomat who's made several journeys to Italy, from, from Italy to Constantinople. And most recently, he was sent by Theodoric to obtain the ornamenta of the palace. This is a reference to the imperial regalia, the orb, scepter, purple cloak, crown, and so on, that had been sent to Constantinople by Odoacer when he deposed the last Roman emperor, Romulus, in 476. And Festus spent some time in Constantinople negotiating with Anastasius, and eventually, uh, uh, he eventually accepted that these ornamenta could go back to Ravenna. So Theodoric has achieved his primary aim of recognition as the undisputed king of Italy. And of course, he's also taking over very large areas of southern France, part of Spain, and quite a lot of the northern Adriatic, eastern coast of the Adriatic and into the Balkans. Um, so his, his kingdom is, is pretty large, and it includes Sicily, which is a very important resource for the city of Ravenna. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned earlier about um, how Anastasius became emperor. Um, and you said that the Empress Ariadne, who had been the, the wife of Zeno, who had, uh, had died, um, chose him and sort of bestowed the uh, em emperorship on him and then married him. Can you just, because that, that just sounds like quite an extraordinary situation. Can you just shed a bit of light on that, why, why it happened? Was that, was that a usual thing to happen? The usual thing is that, son, that sons succeed their father as emperor, but the inconvenience is that some emperors don't have sons or they don't have sons that survive. And Zeno was in this position. He had a son who did not survive and it, it was his grandson um, uh, who, who was, was to be emperor. Um, but that the, the boy did not died young as a baby. And Ariadne, his widowed uh, uh, empress, uh, was therefore uh, left in, in a very uh, ambivalent situation. She was the daughter of an emperor, Leo I. She was also the mother of an emperor who died. She obviously sustained these dynastic claims. And that's what we find very frequently in, in the Roman world and the post-Roman world, women often hold the dynastic continuity and they are the ones who can pass on legitimacy. And therefore, the Senate in Constantinople went to Ariadne and said, well, what are we going to do? You have to remarry, you have to choose someone to be your consort because you are still the empress and we must have you um, sustaining this dynastic claim uh, to rule. And that's the point at which she can exercise some choice, or perhaps they say to her, perhaps it was the case that they negotiated. And she said, no, I don't want to marry another military man. My previous husband was a, just an, a hopeless figure and I want something very solid, somebody I know from the court who can support me and who can uh, get, get in the taxes, do the business and keep the, keep the empire running in a proper efficient fashion. 
And I know you, you, you've written extensively about female power in this time. And I wonder, do you think it was a sort of high, high, high point for um, women being allowed to pit positions of power in terms of the long stretch of history or, or not? It's a high point that other women look back to. But of course, Theodora also plays an, um, an allegedly illegitimate influence on her husband, uh, Justinian, and later empresses in the in the Roman Empire of, of Constantinople constantly knew about these stories of powerful women and they looked to those examples and they reasserted their own power when they could and frequently it was at a moment of succession either because the child of the emperor who died was not old enough to become emperor immediately. A boy aged 10 can't be emperor, but his mother can rule for him as a sort of regent with a council of, of, of other advisors, including the patriarch, bishop, and, and all the leading senators and some military men. They make up a council, but she is the person who holds the power as the mother of the boy who will become emperor when he gains his majority. Fascinating. So I think we're now ready to move on to your second scene, um, which um, is in a different but equally important city. Yes, here we are going to Rome. And as we've discovered, Rome is no longer the imperial capital and indeed has not been the residence of emperors since the late third century when the emperor Diocletian decided to move the court away from Rome. He needed to to establish a base in the east, and he chose the city of Nicomedia for his court, and he also established a co-ruler in the west, who usually used the city of Milan for his court. And of course, where the emperor is, the court has to follow, and all the bureaucrats and administrators, and the whole ramification of government has to be where the emperor is. And in this way, Rome had been very much depleted of rich people, of administrators, bureaucrats, educated people. Many of the senators remained while they could, but they, if they had estates in Italy or Africa that were then conquered by the incoming tribal conquests of the Vandals or the Goths, these senators found themselves in, rather impoverished even the Italian senators who retained their estates in Sicily and places were no longer as rich as they had been. And of course, the city of Rome needed enormous amounts of money just to maintain the walls. And it was so large and so had been expanded so rapidly, there were not enough people to defend it and there were not enough inhabitants. Um, we hear of orchards being planted inside the city on fields that were that where habitation had been abandoned and a lot of the old pagan temples and pagan theatres and baths and other institutions that had been supported by the emperors fell into disrepair. So it would have been this rather romantic but sad crumbling city um, and if we had visited in 500 what kind of people were still living there? The people living in Rome, well there were some senators and there were quite a lot of, of very important figures, uh, Boethius and uh, Symmachus, uh, scholars, teachers in the schools, the law school and the schools of Rome for Latin were very, very famous and still working very, pretty well. We know that there were a number of other very educated people in Rome, including a very interesting monk called Dionysius, a Scythian, who arrived from the East in about the year 500. And he began to collect all the laws relating to church life, the decretals of the popes, the canons of the councils, putting them together in an ordered fashion and as he was doing this work, he also discovered a very interesting thing, which is that he could calculate the dates in which these uh, events had taken place and collections had been made by looking back at the birth of Christ as a formative moment in the calendar. And he was, it was he who invented the BC and AD dating system. He spotted that at the year zero, before Christ and after Christ, could be a way of establishing a Christian dating system. And he established that and dated his documents and put them in order in a way that was extremely intelligent. 
And we don't know exactly when this was achieved because it's probably within a, a 20 year period, he took a long time, but it was certainly partly under the patronage of the bishops of Rome, including Symmachus. Okay, goodness. And so what is actually happening in Rome in, in the year 500 when we're there? The most significant event in the year 500 is actually a visit of, of the King Theodoric, who decides for the first time ever to go to Rome, possibly because he was interested in the disputes between the two rival popes, and he wanted to see how Pope Symmachus was getting on. But it is a very interesting account that we read in the Book of the Popes, um, written in Rome, that the, the, this Arian king, the Gothic king, arrives to make his first visit to Rome. And the first thing he does is to go and venerate the relics of St. Peter at the Vatican, outside the city walls. And then he is met by a, an official welcoming committee, representatives of the Senate, of Pope Symmachus, and then the entire population who come out to welcome him, and accompany him into the city in a formal procession to the forum where he addresses them. And this triumphal atmosphere is followed by circus games, popular entertainment, and the announcement of regular annual distributions of grain to the people. These are the sorts of imperial gifts, um, entertainment, circus racing, um, and actual bread and, and, and wine, and clothing often distributed. But the central reason for Theodoric's visit is that he wants to issue his law book. And it's an edict in 154 chapters, which had been drawn up in Ravenna, to regulate the relations between the Gothic and the Roman populations of his kingdom. They were to be united in what he calls a jus commune, a, a, a shared legal tradition. And because King Theodoric is aware that the Roman emperors usually issued their legal decrees in Rome, he follows imperial precedent in formally promulgating his law code there, having it inscribed on stone and set up in public, I quote, so that both barbarians and Romans may clearly know what they are obligated to follow, end quote. And can you say a tiny bit about, because I think that's a very important feature of Theodoric, is his enthusiasm for Roman culture and imperial tradition and um, his determination to carry on the, these traditions. And can you just tell us a little bit about his childhood? Because I think that was a, played a very important role, didn't it? Indeed. This is absolutely critical because I think that his childhood had been severely disrupted by the arrangement made with his father, who was a Gothic a tribal leader battling against Constantinople, that when they came to a truce and hostages were exchanged, which was the traditional way of confirming a military agreement, Theodoric was sent as an eight-year-old, probably, as a hostage to Constantinople, where he found that he was not alone. There were other hostages from other foreign allies or tribes and peoples with whom the emperor was in an alliance. There's reference to a Georgian prince at about the same time, and there was even a young daughter who was sent as a hostage. And these children were educated, they were treated very well, they were given proper accommodation in imperial palaces, and whenever there was a ceremonial event, the emperor would say, bring out my hostages, and they would all be lined up and he would say, these are my hostages, they are the representatives of their fathers and they, will, they are there, they are kept here so that their fathers will retain and maintain the alliances that we've made with them. But Theodoric was obviously very well trained and I think even better than learning Greek and Latin, he learned how to rule, how to be an emperor because he saw Emperor Leo in this case, Leo I, ruling the emperor, running the court, maintaining a diplomatic corps, receiving and sending embassies, learning about military events and commanding his generals to go out and fight, checking that the taxes were coming in, checking that the expenditure was going out correctly, making appointments and running the empire. And that was something that I think was so, so clearly reproduced in Theodoric's own court when he finally gets to Ravenna and can build a structure of similar, uh, or based on a similar pattern of efficient administration. It's very telling that he was 
he spent 10 years in Constantinople. He grew to adulthood watching these emperors organize their lives. And for example, when there was a terrible earthquake in the 460s, the emperor moved the entire court out of Constantinople, up the Bosphorus to a suburban palace where they could live. And he just carried on the administration while the city of, of Constantinople was rebuilt because many, many buildings fell down in the earthquake and they had to be re completely restored, rebuilt or restored. And so for about a year, they all lived out at St. Mamas and there was a hippodrome built there so that they could have circuses and enjoy the, the sort of entertainment that they, they liked. And Theodoric must have gone there with them because they wouldn't have left the hostages behind. And this whole transport of the court to another venue just shows that the, where the emperor is, the court must go and things continue even when there's a devastating earthquake. Hi, I'm Artemis, one of the presenters on this podcast. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd, one of the world's leading visual historians. His extraordinary photo colorization work has appeared on the covers of National Geographic, Life and People magazines, and he's worked on special projects for titles like The Times of London and NPR. Through his expertly researched and detailed work, Jordan has brought to life some of the most famous events and people from modern history, whether it's his portrait of Abraham Lincoln or his sweeping panorama of the D-Day beaches in 1944. One of my current favourites is a photograph taken on the 1911 Terra Nova expedition to the Antarctic. The original shot is strange and beautiful, and it shows just how otherworldly parts of our planet can sometimes look, but the image is completely elevated by the deep and icy blues that Jordan's colourisation work brings out. This, alongside many others, are available to buy as prints, and they make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past. To find your favourite historical image, have a look at Jordan's site at www.colorgraph.co. Yeah, the show must go on. I love the idea of this, obviously, extremely intelligent um, boy just watching and absorbing and learning and um you know all, all of this information and and then knowing that you know he's going to put it to use when he's older um which indeed he did i think it's a fascinating idea um uh let's go on to your third scene now which um i believe we are going to be um arriving in ravenna finally finally we are going to ravenna um it's important to note that Theodoric spent about six months in Rome in the year 500 and then he left and he never went back because he was very, very much more concerned with building his own capital city in Ravenna and he wanted it to be look, to look like Constantinople, not Rome. Now it did have all its old pagan buildings. It had all the Roman, uh, traditional Roman uh, uh, circuses, hippodromes, uh, fortress walls, very, very well fortified. It was a city built on marshland, which made it quite difficult to besiege. It was very, there was a very watery atmosphere, lots of rivers coming, tributaries of the Po Valley coming down, making the swampy land quite difficult to negotiate. And the city of Ravenna had been securely fortified and he wished to um, con continue that strong fortification but expand the city and build more and he clearly expanded the imperial palace which had been built by Honorius and uh, his successors and he then started building for his Aryan Goths. So the most important thing he had to do was to create churches of a of beauty and a scale to rival the Catholic churches which had, were already very amazing in Ravenna so that his Gothic Aryan Christians could celebrate their faith in a suitable environment. And we know that there was a new cathedral built and the baptistry attached to that cathedral survives and is a very impressive baptistry. But the church that he built as his palace church, uh, not a small chapel, but an enormous basilica, is the church that continues to amaze visitors to Ravenna to this day. It is a very, very impressive 
monument now known under the dedication to Santa Apollinari Nuovo. Saint Apollinaris is one of the patron saints of the city of Ravenna. But Theodoric's original church had been dedicated to Christ the Saviour. A very interesting dedication to the, to the Christ. And it was decorated in the early 6th century with the most extraordinary series of tiers of mosaics, because it's very tall, the basilica, with huge windows. And at the upper, upper level under the ceiling, were scenes from the life of Christ, some of the earliest and most spectacular, um, devoted on the north side to the uh, miracles of, of, of the gospel stories and on the south side to the week of, the, of the, the last week of Christ's life. And these are really most extraordinarily interesting. And, and I think they are paralleled elsewhere, but these are very particularly beautiful and brilliant. And in the second tier, we have a row of male saints on both sides. And in the third tier, a long procession of martyrs who advance from the west to the east end of the church, bearing their martyrs' crowns. Women on the north side, men on the left side. And they advance from the cities of Classis and Ravenna. So that was right next door to Ravenna, wasn't it? That was the, 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 but on the sea. So that was the port city. Is that correct? Yes. And he would have been uh, represented himself with his port officials standing in front of the fortifications of the harbour. And so these two cities named and represented in their full glory, urban scapes with sort of roofs of churches and baptistries and buildings are very visible claims on the new capital city that Theodoric was building, very spectacular. And they survive, although they have been modified by the removal of the king's portrait. He's no longer visible there. But he would have been originally. And who, who, because I think that's that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, um, you know, that there's the, this mosaic, the mosaics with the the curtains, and then blank inside, just gold. And obviously, I mean, it's just so obvious there should have been a figure in the middle. So can you just tell us about that? So the the, the all the depictions of Theodoric were removed by by who and when and why. <laughs> They were removed by Archbishop Agnellos, who held sway in the 560s. Now, in 540, the troops of Belisarius, the Byzantine general, brought the East Roman troops from Constantinople all the way up Italy, and they finally entered Ravenna. And the Goths were there, the Gothic kingdom, which had survived until that point, was therefore brought to an end. Although the Goths did not accept defeat, and they went off and elected another leader and started fighting back and indeed extended the war in Italy for another 17 years, so it was, or 13 years. So it was a long, long drawn out war that was very damaging. But in the city of Ravenna, once it changed hands, Byzantine, that is East, East Roman officials, came from Constantinople to administer the city. The new bishop, Maximian, was appointed by Justinian. And in this way, the city came back under imperial control. And also Catholic control, right? And it was under Catholic control. And therefore, in due course, Justinian said, and we legislate, that the churches of the Aryan Christians must be returned to the Catholics. And therefore, the Gothic community lost their churches. They lost their, their, their priests, lost their houses and the baths and the charitable institutions that they'd run for the poor. And the Gothic identity as Aryan Christians gradually died away because it, it, it was also legislated that people of Aryan dis, um, belief cannot make wills and may not pass their inheritance on to their families to their children. And therefore there was a very clear economic reason why it was very difficult to sustain Aryan belief. And there were in the 560s when Bishop Agnellus made this conversion, I think he had about eight or nine churches, some outside the city, some inside the city. And the ones that had been decorated with portraits of Theodoric were transformed. And in Santa Polinari Nuovo, the image of the king seated on his throne under uh, the image of his palace 
was removed and just replaced with gold. And in the columns that supported his palace, in, there had been representations, we presume, of individuals, probably courtiers, raising their hands. The courtiers were taken away, curtains were inserted, but oh dear, they managed to leave behind some of the hands. Hmm. And does that mean that, that we don't have any images of Theodoric today? Any but... images of, of, just, of, of Theodoric? Yes. Are there none left? We have none in Santa Polinari and none in any other church, but we do have a very impressive gold coin that was made of the weight of three gold coins, very large sort of medallion, which has a portrait of him. And it's a very interesting portrait of a man wearing a Roman imperial uniform, holding an orb and scepter. And he wears his hair in the Gothic style and he has a little moustache. He does not look like a Roman emperor, but his costume and everything about his stance is entirely imperial. <laughs> That's so interesting. So he was just a complete um, mixture of uh, imperial Roman and um, Gothic. It's a symbiosis, which means that these two communities had, were actually integrated in a very new and exciting way. And I think what makes Ravenna so successful is that it had managed to include, integrate and bring together these two communities. Even when the Gothic tradition died away, there were differences between the newcomers and the old established Italian families who'd been there forever. And then there were other newcomers that came in. And of course, there were traders and merchants and, and people coming through the city who were not native to it. But that symbiosis made it a very, very, uh, not just um, multicultural in the sense that we think of mixed cities like many ports, but actually integrated in a tolerant style, which meant that the Jews could continue to worship in their synagogues and other organizations had their own guilds, their own uh, um, structures. We learn of barracks uh, and garrisons where particular Gothic um, contingents were housed and other garrisons where the more local Roman soldiers were housed and sometimes they quarreled and fought in the streets. And so we understand that there was, there were differences, there were really big differences between the groups in Ravenna, but they all were, they were all encouraged to, to, to get along. And the notion of toleration became one of those things that Theodoric is famous for because he said to the Jews, yes, I don't agree with your belief. I think it's a wrong belief, but I cannot force you to believe against your will. That's wrong. He sounds like a very enlightened um, ruler, doesn't he? Well, he, he, he certainly tried to present himself in that way. But I think because his, his group were a minority and had a, a minority faith that had been condemned as heretical by the bishops in Rome, for example, he had to find a way to make it possible for them to get on with their lives and worship in their ways, in their language, because we know that the Gothic language continued to be spoken and indeed written. Some of the um, papyri, the legal documents that are preserved in Ravenna, reveal that uh, Gothic people signed in Gothic, using their Gothic script, which I can't read, you know, it's, yeah. it's a language, <laughs> it's another language. It's, it's, it was created for them so that their Germanic tongue could be represented in writing. And that is a very, and that's a, 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 that continues to be a, a condition. But they all managed to get along. And I think it's why when we look at Ravenna today, we can see that it was the source of so, so much inspiration for later rulers. Well, and also, I mean, the, the city continued to flourish for at least, 200 years didn't it and I do think that's interesting um you know it's it happens again and again when you're studying history that you you notice that the cities which are inclusive which have different faith and national communities working and living within them tend to be the ones that are more successful well I mean which makes complete sense but I just think that that is an important and pertinent an idea today as it ever has been. It is indeed, and it's why I think Ravenna stands as a sort of symbol of the first European city, because it, it, Rome was very much under the uh, 
in the in the gr grasp of the bishops of Rome, who quarrelled among themselves and quarrelled with 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 other religious leaders and struggled to impose their authority. But it was essentially an ecclesiastical centre, and other cities. For example, Syracuse in Sicily retained quite a lot of its, of its old Roman traditions like a hippodrome where they had chariot racing into the seventh century, um, unlike in other parts of the Roman world. But nonetheless, it didn't have that symbiosis of the Germanic and the Roman, which makes Ravenna so important. Mm. Um, oh, I just can't wait to go. Anyway, um... I think we have arrived at the moment when I need to ask you the final question, uh, which is, of course, um, if you had been able to pick something up from one of these scenes to bring back to the present with you, what would it be? I would like to have a leaf of the Gothic Bible written in gold and silver letters on a purple dyed parchment. Oh, beautiful. It is a most astonishing thing. There's one almost complete that's preserved in Uppsala in the university library, and it is to, to, to admire, really something. But very few of these Bibles survived. They may have been luxury items that weren't produced in great number, but of course there must have been a lot of, of Gothic uh, manuscripts produced, and I'd like to have a leaf of that purple Bible, please. That's a great choice. That would look really beautiful, framed up on your wall, maybe. Um, thank you so much, Judith. I've really enjoyed our escape back to 500, and uh, it's been really interesting talking to you. Thank you for coming on. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. That was me, Violet Moller, talking to Professor Judith Heron about her beautiful new book, Ravenna, Capital of Empire, Crucible of Europe which was published in August by Alan Lane and is available in all good bookshops. It would make a lovely Christmas present. It's a fascinating read and is full of stunning photographs. To have a look at some of those pictures and to get more information about this episode, please go to our website, tttpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>